Of course, personally, it was difficult. Um, but we were given very strict instructions by the law. And I feel through our deliberation process, we followed that. And we came to the decision that we needed to. Um, I would actually prefer not to discuss our specifics of our deliberation, if that's okay. Can you answer this? Was there a moment when you were sitting in that box that struck you the most, that sort of resonated with you the most, a piece of testimony, a piece of evidence? <laughs> what didn't resonate with me? The entire trial. I mean, the testimony especially of the surviving victims. <laughs> How could it not touch you? Um, it had nothing to do with my faith or religion. I mean, my religion is my religion. That's what I believe. It was the law. It was based on the law. When you found out you were on the jury of the Anthony Sowell trial, did that put you in a certain mindset? This is going to be a long time away from your family. This is going to be away from work. This is going to turn your life upside down. When you found out it was this case, did that impact you at all? Not really because I didn't know exactly how long it was going to last, whether it was going to be long or short. I really didn't know. And since I'm retired, it wasn't like, uh, I mean, travel time, yes, it, it bothered me. But other than that, I didn't look at that as a factor. Remember, there was, um, when you all were discussing it before you decided, um, before you just about, did, did anybody feel like they had to I'd rather not answer that. What? I prefer not to answer that. A great deal because, you know, it was a horrible situation for the family and you know, it's, you, you can't overlook that. You just can't overlook that. Actually, it does not, and it does not because I follow <clears throat> I follow the law. Uh, the evidence was there, and the instructions were followed, and the specific laws that apply were followed. And since I follow the law, it does not weigh any heavily on me at all. It does not. I feel absolutely comfortable with my decision. If anything at all, it reinforces my confidence in the system. It works, yes. I totally disregarded his testimony. Totally disregarded it. It, it had absolutely no merit for me. No remorse, no acceptance of guilt, and as we now say, he was malingering. <laughs> he was 
he was malingering. That's all that, that's all that was, as far as I'm concerned. Fake. He was faking it. That's what that means. You made it worse, yes. It was without substance. We, we, uh, it didn't affect our thoughts. It was without merit, I agree. We, uh, Sir, I mentioned the malingering. What do you make of the soul's mental state? I believe a lot of malingering in, during his testing, his psychological testing, there was malingering on his part. When he was on the stand, I saw him appear to steer, uh, tear up when, when he spoke about his sister. Did you notice him tear up when his former cellmate tried to spare his life? I wasn't looking at him at the did time. Did you notice that? Yes. Some of you did. Did you just discuss that? Things in the way to block the view. Sorry? Mm -hmm. There were things in the way sometimes that would block our view. Okay. But that's neither here nor there. That's right. No. Was his courtroom demeanor important in any way um, throughout the case one or case two? Yes, it's very important. He sat there so stoically. And uh, only on rare occasions would he respond animately or something. Well, it was beneficial to him. He yeah. responded quite nicely. He was very amicable. He was very, he played to the cameras and to us. He gave us a lot of eye contact, which was unwarranted, unwanted. I think he made a lot of eye contact when it was to his benefit and um, it personally offended me because he even winked at me once. What was that about? Why are you winking? This is serious here. Your life is on the line. Why are you winking? Are you trying to um, make uh, an ally of me or, you know, trying to touch bases with any of the jurors to try to win us over to your side, I took offense to it. Um, and I'd like to answer something that you said. You wanted to know, or someone else asked, if there was any point during the um, trial that was profound for us, and I'd like to say it was Vanessa Gay. She, she, she was very profound to me. And so were the other um, living survivors. And her testimony spoke volumes. So that weighed on me personally. How did you share that? Thank you for that. You're welcome. How did you share that with you um, to come to a conclusion to that? It wasn't difficult, as the other jurors said. We went strictly by the instructions and we followed the law. Personally, for me, I was called in here to do a job. It was my duty to abide by the law. And the law was following the instructions. And if the aggravated circumstances outweighed the mitigating factors, then death was the punishment. And that's how we came to that decision. Did you think this would be that um, almost business-like way? Did you fear that that would happen on the personal feelings might somehow enter into it? I totally put my personal feelings to the side and to answer the young lady's question that was standing over there about Christianity, I am a Christian, but my personal feelings had nothing to do with it. I was called to do a job and I did it. At the same time though, it's kind of overwhelming to look at the picture and see what you all have access to. Did you ever have a moment in life when you were alone where maybe you got emotional or maybe you had to say to yourself, pull it together, I have a lot to do here. I mean, we're still human. We are human, and I am human. I'm very much human. And if you were here every day, you probably would have um, witnessed me tearing up quite a few times. But I turned my back from the gallery so that I wouldn't lose it. 
but I did tear up quite a bit. Never once did I dream about any of the pictures. I didn't look at them over and over again because I didn't want to burn the, the uh, vision in my head. So I never had any nightmares about the pictures from the morgue. We went over all the evidence in the jury room. We, I even looked at all the coroner's reports, but I refused to let that affect my personal life. I didn't come here for that. I came here to render my opinion about this case, and that's what I did. And I intend to leave here and put Anthony so well behind me. considering calling and talking about it because my wife has noted that, that I'm a different person, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit distracted, and about the pictures, there are several that once I glanced at I couldn't look at it anymore. Right. I mean, there, and in my mind, it was important for me to know who the victims were, where they were, where they were found, and uh, the chronological order of, of how it occurred. And, uh, and as we went through the first phase, each, each group of accounts was per victim, as was on the penalty phase. And we would bring uh, each victim's complete file up with their, their pictures, and we would discuss their life. And uh, we went with this in respectful thoughtfulness, complete respectfulness for the, the victims' lives that were given. So who they were in life. Right. Mattered to us. Yeah, mattered. And we wanted to have their living picture up, not the picture of them on the morgue, the coroner's table. We posted their picture of them smiling, and we'd often make comments, oh, she has the prettiest eyes, or she had the nicest smile. That's how we remembered them. So that's why I don't have nightmares, because I see them as they were prior to Anthony Sowell's. Say again, please. The collective decision to withhold your names. Oh, what about it? Can you explain the We've the decided decision? not to, we've, and I think I can safely speak mm -hmm. for the group, we decided not to release our names for um, personal safety from either side. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We don't want to take that chance. And just for our um, privacy, I'm an extremely private person. I don't want everybody knowing where I live or... I don't want you to come to my house and knock on my door. I have daughters. So I'd really respect, the, I'd really hope you would respect our privacy as well as, you know, my privacy as well as the, the group's privacy. That's why we came to that decision and it was unanimous. So. Anyone else struggling with the decision? I know that during number five, so you may call uh, a counselor. Anybody else thinking about taking the county and what it's offered? I am. Mm -hmm. Just to discuss it, just yeah. to get it out and Clear. move on. Folks, do you mind? I know this is a little different, but Ms. Gay, you said resonated with. She did. Yeah. She did. Sitting next to her, she asked if she could say something to you. Is it okay? If she yes. Be fine. Right. Yes. We did see you, and we still do. You, you weren't an individual with a drug problem. You were a woman that was raped. You were beat. Nobody deserves that, man or woman. So I definitely saw you as an individual that had something extremely traumatic happen to you, and you didn't deserve that. You resonated with me more than anybody. If I cried, I cried for you. I, I felt your pain, and I cried for you. So you're welcome. If it wasn't for the five surviving victims, 
that truly gave us their testimony, which established his M.O. that went back to 1989. And that was just invaluable to us as our ability to sort through, because what can you discern from a, a bag of bones or a body buried under the steps? I mean, it, you had to you had to have something to go in the living testimony of those victims, which as painful as it was for them, mm -hmm. we understand that. I just want to say too, I just hope uh, throughout this whole ordeal that, that I was able to bring some closure to the victims' families and to the victims. I, I hope that overall that we were able to do that with us following the law. I hope that did something for you. So you're welcome. Can I just say just a quick thank you for what you did? Because you were very brave to do that. And there's a left women that are like, thank you. You know, I felt like I was pretty level throughout it all. I'm a very strong Christian. The lady asked about who was a Christian. And uh, I did write a prayer, which we did pray, you know, in session. And I hope she finds that out. Um, but I have to say that this, this second phase, um, it's, it's hit me. Uh, I mean, of course, all along I prayed every day, every night um, for the right direction. You know, not for what I wanted, but... Uh, I'm very, very grateful for the jurors here um, because we did need each other's cooperation in this matter. And, uh, and I certainly, as a Christian, wanted God's will in this matter. Um, and uh, I, I believe that because the state of Ohio um, directed us as to what the law is, uh, we were able to come to this conclusion uh, with a legal decision, not our own personal emotional decision, even though we had many, many emotions attached to this. And um, I just don't want us to forget those 11 beautiful women. Uh, everyone has problems. Everyone has done things that are wrong. And I also say that I had tears for Anthony, and there may be people that don't appreciate that, but he is a person too. Um, I looked at a lot of mitigating. I, I won't say more because I don't want to talk about their face, but, um, you know, we're all people, and uh, the decision was based on the law. Um, not the defense's witnesses. Actually, I um, found the prosecutor's witnesses um, more in line with what I believe in. So the witnesses in psychology that the defense team brought in, I dispelled everything that they said. I don't think they were very forthcoming with the truth. So. I'll go first since I have the mic. <laughs> when we walked in that house, and as I ascended up to the second floor, I had such an overwhelming feeling come over me that I stopped dead in my tracks, and I felt this heavy, heavy sense of sadness hit me, and I said, I literally braced myself on the banisters and said, oh my God, something bad happened here. And then I started to cry, but all the other jurors were behind me, and I told myself literally, Renee, don't fall apart. Get yourself together. Just get yourself together because everybody's following you. I knew something horrible happened in that house. My chest felt like a cement block just landed straight on it, and I did like this. Oh, my God. And I felt like I just wanted to cry. So that was a 
that was one of the most horrible experiences I experienced during this whole thing was going through that house. I have two thoughts about the house. One, I wish it would have occurred a week after we got into the case because there were things I would have wanted to see that I saw in the opening statements and as the evidence and the photos were, were being introduced that I would have paid more attention to uh, that I didn't. Uh, but the second thought to me, it was an immediate realization that there's a group of society that I knew nothing about. That is so contrary from, from anything that I experience on a daily life as to where I live and the people I live with. And I continue to experience those thoughts throughout this trial. ask about jury experience. At the beginning, I was, of course, I was intimidated by the plays, by the role, by the everything, and, and one of the issues was about the law, how to read it, how to, how to respond to situation. And during the first phase, there was a question about the evidence, and I took the role of being very critical about the evidence. And I had the room and time to discuss, or every, I think everybody had time and room to discuss about everything, all the questions we had. And I was difficult because the situation was difficult for me. <laughs> what helped me, it helped me people who stand here who experience situation with Anthony Solo. And whatever was blank in evidence, the evidence came from their words. And by reading my own notes from the, from the situation, I think it changed everything. And this is what I want to say, thank you very much. Thank you guys.